Ah, all right. One of my favorite podcasts in the world, I'm not a huge podcast listener, I only have like three or four that I like, but one of my favorites is a podcast called Song Exploder. Have any of you heard of Song Exploder? Do you know what this is? Any music nerds in the room? Okay. So each week, the host, whose name is difficult to pronounce, but I'm going to try, is uh, Rushkesh Herway. He asks a musician or a band to deconstruct one of their songs down to the bare bones parts. How did they write the song? Where did they come from? What's the backstory? And then they get into how did they record it? What did all of the individual parts sound like if you isolate them? If you could just take the drums out of a song off of Abbey Road, what would that sound like? Or just one vocal, or just one guitar, and hear it all by itself. Does it still sound like the song? No. What was the linchpin or the key thing that held a fancy song together? Was it a word or a drum beat or a particular note on a guitar that just brought the whole thing together? Who sang the harmonies? Who added the shaker, right? It's an amazing podcast. I highly recommend it. It's also on Netflix. They have a couple of actual show versions of it um, about how all the parts come together to create a cohesive and a moving whole. St. Paul writes today that just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Just as a song is one and has many instruments and many voices, it is still one song, even though it's made of many parts. We too in this place, in this congregation, are one. Not all of us are lead singers. You know I know that. That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> But we still are all part of the whole. I want you to look again, um, just for a second, at verse 28 in that reading from 1 Corinthians. Go ahead and pull that up. I know, making you look at stuff. You can do it. <laughs> Have you ever thought about the which of these roles that Paul describes here might be your role? This is not an abstract thing that Paul is, is writing about. These are actual roles in a faith community that he's describing for us. He says that as the church, we've been given these roles. Prophets, teachers, doing deeds of power. That sounds exciting, like a Marvel superhero, right? Gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of translation. So, what are you? Are you an apostle? Do you have a gift of healing? Can you translate things? An apostle is someone who follows someone else, learns from them, right? Could you be an apostle? A prophet is someone who tells the truth and then gets killed for it. Any prophets out there? Yeah? I know that some of you are teachers, whether it was your primary occupation or not. I want you to take just a minute right now and set with these roles and see which one you might feel most called to. Apostle, truth teller, teacher, healer, assistant, leader, translator. All right, teachers, who are you? Raise your hand. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Healers, are any of you healers? Paul? Mm -hmm. Truth tellers, are you out there? Yes, we know, we know each other when we see each other too, right? Yes, truth tellers. I'm watching us, by the way, dangerous. Each of us has and can find our role in the body of Christ if we but open ourselves to thinking about these things in new ways or realize a felt need in the community. You may not realize that you were needed to be a teacher, but perhaps it could be your gift. So, 
as a body, <laughs> we've been through a lot in the last two years. Hmm? Clearly, we're in the third year of our global pandemic, where we've weathered things like online school and working from home and worshiping on our phones and mass amounts of social isolation. As a congregation, we've learned together how to migrate to online worship. How strange is that? It's a trial for sure, but it's a gift, even continuing into these days for folks that cannot yet be with us. And shockingly, we discovered that the gospel can still be heard and be efficacious through circuits and LCDs and the internet. We amazingly managed to renovate this aging building into a beautiful light-filled space without losing the sense of holiness and grace that has always been a comfort for the last 70 years on this ground. And we answered the call to pledge to be debt-free in the next three years in these times that are far from financially simple. And even now, we are facing the retirement of my beloved colleague. And more than just a departure, it will create a sea change in this congregation as we wade into the waters of interim and transition just a month from now. As we've navigated through these times of immense upheaval and uncertainty, many of us have pared down our social circles. Yes, any of you pared down your social circles? Either by chance or by choice, each of us has had to make a call in the face of all of this about what matters, what's worth our energy, what's worth the risk, what's worth the exposure to maintain contact and relationship. Each of us weighs daily who to protect, right? Ourselves, our dependents, our loved ones, our neighbors. As we've begun to up periscope a little bit, we hopefully did that last fall and then down periscope again, I found myself wondering, how are we all doing? I think about all the new people that I've been meeting here in worship. It's been amazing. People are finding their way to this congregation, seeking hope and new life after so much loss and separation. And boy, howdy, we're so glad that those folks are finding their way here. I think with wonder and with joy about those of you who have remained steadfast despite the somewhat lackluster long-term appeal of online worship, week after week, we have faithful folks who join us online. And those of you who have kept being here in person, kept us on your short list of approved places to go, I see you. I think about all of those who I've not actually seen, but who have let us know they're alive from time to time by a prayer request, or survey response. <laughs> and I also think about those whom I have not seen or heard from at all, who are members of this body of Christ, part of this community, and pray that they'll find their way back here, one way or another, when they're able. Y'all, we are so tired as a culture as a society, and this wave of Omicron right now is, is hitting a little bit different. Yes, it is for me. It is in my house. I had to help Weller this last week with remote learning again as his school went remote because they had so many teachers and kids that were sick that they couldn't staff the school fully. And when I heard him back in his bedroom with his school-assigned iPad, listening to his amazing teacher pivot to provide his beautiful brain with learning fodder, it kind of knocked me down pretty hard. Like I have remote learning PTSD. I can't do this again, I thought. I don't want to go back into the cave. I can't imagine what the educators are thinking and feeling. It was hard enough to 
2020 and 2021. I don't want to do it again. Other parents, are you with me? And this next level exhaustion, this weariness that we're feeling, and to some degree, there's an emptiness to it, is coming to a point of almost indifference. Okay, I guess we'll go remote. Okay, I'll do another Zoom meeting. Okay. It's as if we know we should be more worried or more upset, but we've run out of fuel to give to the pandemic and have become kind of numb to it. And for me, in my pastoral heart of hearts, this numbness is a warning. In my heart, in my gut, in my soul, it's precisely why we need to remember and remind each other that we are in this together. This body of Christ here, look at each other. This body of Christ here, I'm looking at you, you look at each other as well. We are here in this particular place and time for a reason. And we are going to hold one another up because honestly, I don't think any of us can do this alone right now. We are beyond the place where we get to say, no, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Thanks for asking. I'm okay. No, you're not. Each of us has a role to play in this and is needed. You may think to yourself, I don't have very much to give right now. And that's all right. Jesus made the most of the widow's might. Jesus made the most of the loaves and the fishes. Jesus, just last week, turned bath water into wine. I'm pretty sure that Jesus will take all the remaining gumption that we've got and make it into exactly what this little corner of Seattle needs. Because it needs hope. This community needs to remember that things are not as dire as they seem. This congregation is so blessed with gifts and with talents and with resources. We are a body of Christ on this corner because we are precisely what is needed for each other, for the greater good, for our neighbor. Alone and spread out, we don't have much to offer. But together, we are a boon of joy and of dancing. My cousin Carl, Carl Fay, is a pastor in Illinois. Um, and he's a sculptor and an artist and a painter. He's trained as an artist before he went to seminary. And he wrote um, such an encouraging word about prayer this week. If you follow our friends of me on Instagram or Facebook, I posted it there. You may have seen it. But this encouragement toward prayer, toward bringing a word back to God, is exactly how I feel about the word that we have today, about the hope and exhaustion, about the love and frustration that we carry with us. The kind of prayer that he is writing about, the authenticity of it, is exactly the kind of praying that reminds us we're not alone in these times. I want to share a little bit of it with you so you can take it with you this week, um, and I'll send it out later. Carl writes... Send out your SOS and declare a state of emergency. Ugly cry and use the entire box of tissues. Hurl expletives. Throw chairs. Not these ones. <laughs> Dance like no one is watching. Sing like you're singing in the shower. Whoop and holler and cheer. Use your outside voice. Or sit silent and say nothing. Take a walk. Don't feel obligated to talk. Say all you need to get off your chest. Don't worry as though you're wasting God's time. Or God's watching the clock. It has to be somewhere else. Blush with embarrassment. Beam with pride. Be amused. Shrug your shoulders. Groan. Air your grievances. Just be and breathe. Steal like an artist and use someone else's words aren't that original. This isn't a talent show. Complain about the people you wish you didn't have to live with. Gush with gratitude about the people you can't live without. Let your jaw hang open in amazement and a little drool fall out. 
throw your thanks for everything you often take for granted. Take note of all that's sick and wrong in the world and long for God to make it right. Collapse into God's arm and take a nap because life is exhausting. He goes on. Jesus in the temple today says, this is the year of the Lord's favor. And we say, that's what you said about last year, Jesus. 2021 didn't seem that great. Because that was true. But it is true. And it's true this year as well. Because despite hardship and missing every event and remote learning PTSD and forgetting how to behave properly in social situations, Jesus still tells us that we are called to bring good news to the poor. As the body of Christ, we read this word of God through the prophet Isaiah, proclaimed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, and hear the challenge in it. There's a dare to us. Jesus is saying, I dare you. We are the hands and the feet and the body of Christ. We are the apostles and the prophets and the teachers and the healers. We are the ones who pray. We are the ones who assist. It's us. We are sent to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's like Jesus is saying, I dare you. It's us. This is the year. We are the body. We are going to need every one of us to stay connected and called in this time. Amen?